Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you again this morning from up here. We've started a new sermon series for this month, and it's called The Season of Harvest. We started in August, near the end of August, with the Ecclesiastes verse about for everything there is a season. And last month, we called it a season of change, and this month, a season of harvest. And so we, our themes for these Sundays will be about the idea of harvest. So I wanted to ask you your opinion first. Um, when you think of harvest, maybe you close your eyes and think of a harvest. What, what do you think of? Just throw out something. What do you think of when you think of harvest? Tractors. Big fields, big fields. What kind of crops, when you think of harvest, what kind of crops? Corn, what? Cotton, okay, cool. How about that big round thing that sits on the ground out there? All right, so I, um, I looked up what was the largest pumpkin anyone ever grew. And I know by how many pounds it is what the largest one is. So give me a guess. How large do you think the biggest pumpkin ever grown is? A thousand? Forty-six hundred? Twenty? Are you Googling? <laughs> that's close. That's about right. Yeah, that's about right. So, yeah, so... Um, so I think of also big things. I don't think of a pumpkin that big usually, but I think of a field that is full of the crop. So the seed, whatever was going to happen with the seed, now it's completely happened and it's finished and it's full and it's glorious. I didn't grow up in a farming family, but did anyone here grow, grow up in a farming family? If so, lift up. Okay, so quite, quite a few of you. So I didn't grow up in a farming family, but my dad came from people who were farmers who moved here from Nebraska around in the 30s. And um, so when I was about 12, they took me back to Nebraska to see what that was all about. And it was July, in fact, it was the 4th of July, and there was a harvest about to go on with the corn. And I was very surprised, because I like corn, but to see that it was higher than I was and that it was everywhere. And I'll never forget seeing that near harvest and also the great 4th of July fireworks because every family had their own fireworks and their own apple pie. And um, it was with tractors all around. <laughs> it was wonderful. So I'm thinking that when the disciples asked their question, um, beginning in, in Luke chapter 17, we're gonna go verse by verse in these few verses. When they asked their question or said to Jesus, increase our faith, they were thinking that their faith was really little. It wasn't near harvest or it wasn't that mature. So I'm thinking these are the disciples saying this. This isn't like someone from the crowd or some Pharisees that were about to get converted. This is Jesus' disciples, and Luke 17 is really far along in them knowing him, really far along in their ministry together. They've watched him do stuff. They've done stuff themselves, including healing people. They have heard everything he had to say. They've watched um, how he worked tirelessly to love people and help people. They should know everything. They should be ready for their seed to have grown into harvest. They should be ready to graduate, right? They should be the smartest, best, most faithful people. So as this scripture starts out, it says, Jesus, increase our faith. So it might help to know what they were talking about right before that, when they said that. Well, right before that, Jesus was telling them they had to forgive their brother or sister seven times seven or 70 times seven. They were like, how many times do we have to forgive them? If, if somebody we are with, and one of our colleagues, one of our brothers or sisters messes up, do we forgive them one time, give them one more chance? Two times? Jesus says no. Like, the number of times really means an infinite number of times. 
that's when they said, increase our faith. So it kind of makes sense. Increase our faith. So Jesus replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed. So the um, video that's recording this sermon didn't get to look down into the cup of mustard seeds, but you all could probably see or you already know that mustard seeds are, if it dropped on this floor, it would be hard to find it. I'd have to get down on my hands and knees and maybe turn my phone into a flashlight to find it because they're really, really small. And back in the day of Jesus' time, I kind of looked it up and found out that this was a common saying, that mustard seeds had a reputation for being really small. If you wanted to talk about something that was small, talk about a mustard seed. That's what people would talk about. It's like a, another word for something really small. So he says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and we're all maybe thinking about the other time he talked about the mustard seed, which was actually two other times. One time he said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. Okay? And another time he said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's the littlest of seeds. And then it grows and grows and grows into one of the biggest of trees and birds nest in its branches, giving us an idea that the kingdom of God starts small, but it grows and it's everywhere. Well, this time Jesus is going to say something else about mustard seeds, something different in Luke. So Jesus must have talked about mustard seeds a lot, and each gospel writer recorded a little bit of that. So Jesus is going to say, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So there's a metaphor I don't think of every day. A mulberry tree is a pretty big tree, maybe 60 feet tall. It's got real big, wide branches. It's great for shade. It probably also has birds nesting in its branches. So if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could tell a tree like that that has a huge root system, by the way, to get out of the ground and to not only be thrown in the sea, but it be planted in the sea. I want you to let, let that sit with you for a minute. Does anything sound more ridiculous than that? Does it, has anyone wanted to uproot a large tree and plant it in the ocean? I don't see anybody nodding. I see people looking at me with glazed eyes. No. <laughs> no. So I think that the fact that this sounds ridiculous is part of the magnitude of what Jesus is trying to say here. If you had faith that small, even that much, like you don't understand about faith, it's not about how big it's about faith itself. If you have faith itself, you need to understand and realize and believe that you can do impossible things. You can do things that no one could ever expect you to do. And he's using an example so outrageous that no one would do and that couldn't even be done. I wonder how many tractors it would take and ropes to pull a mulberry tree out. And then what truck you would take to put it over into the Atlantic Ocean and plant it and how you would accomplish that. So I'm thinking what Jesus is saying is if you had any kind of faith, because you're not understanding what faith is, you could do like Moses did. Remember, Moses was told by God, I'm going to get the people out of Egypt, and I want you to be the main guy to help bring them out. Does that sound almost as ridiculous? Hundreds of thousands of people coming out of slavery from an empire with a lot of big chariots and weapons to bring them across the sea and into freedom, I would say that's, it would be easier to do the mulberry tree thing than that. Think about the faith that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had. An angel comes up to you, you're just doing your thing, and says, you are going to be pregnant with the Holy Spirit. And she says, here I am, servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Doesn't that sound a little bit more amazing than picking up a mulberry tree, getting it to the Atlantic Ocean and putting it down? So what Jesus is trying to say to us is, you not, 
Disciples, you're not really thinking about what faith is. It's not the size. It's not like some huge thing you can see. It's that gift from God, that little gift from God that inside of you is huge and can get you to do with your power from God what God wants you to do with your life, with your relationships, with that impossible, crazy thing that God wants you to do. So that sounds really good. It sounds really big and really exciting. And then Jesus goes on, and I'm going to finish with these last few lines that are going to kind of surprise you, I think. Jesus says, well, let's just change the subject for a second here. Who among you would say to your slave who's just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Okay, so that's a rhetorical question, right? When your slave comes in from plowing the field, you don't say, come, come get it to the family table and eat with us. Nobody would say that. Wouldn't you rather say to him, Prepare supper for me. Put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink. Later you can eat and drink. Right. That's what a slave does. Um, in those days, it's said that maybe as many as 50% of people in the Roman Empire were slaves. This is a, a culture that we cannot, it's very hard to comprehend, but understand when Paul says, I'm a slave of Jesus, or somebody uses those words, you're using hum humility, servanthood. So yes, that's what you would say. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? This is another rhetorical question. The answer is going to be no. So also when you, you disciples, when you, you, have done all that you were ordered to do, you say, we are worthless slaves. We've done only what we ought to have done. When you do something out of this huge faith that looks tiny, you're not doing it to look huge. You're not doing it for praise. You're not doing it for people to say to you, oh, Christy, you did so good in following God. We are so amazed at you. You do it and say, I'm only doing what God asked. I'm only doing what God asked. When you sang in the choir today, I'm just doing what God asked me to do. So let's go back for a moment as we complete with this scripture that Kyle read, just this little piece of it. So Timothy was a protege, a, a, a younger man who worked with Paul, the, the apostle. You know, Paul's like the famous one. And Paul's writing this to Timothy, who was a younger man who worked with him and went on uh, trips with him and shared the gospel with him. And he's saying, Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. These scriptures that we've been looking at this morning really go well together, and here's why. I think that this picture of faith is what Jesus has been trying to paint for his disciples in that other passage. There's nothing more perhaps little and ordinary than a family life, than family life. Than ordin Can you imagine what Lois and Eunice did? Nowhere in the Bible does it say they moved mountains or replanted mulberry trees or brought people out of Egypt or did something so amazing. The amazing thing they did with their little bit of faith was they had a family. They had children, or they took care of children. The slave who did just what the slave was asked and didn't look for thanks and gushing praise, isn't that a little bit like parenting or grandparenting? Or being a child in a family, you just do what you're gonna do. You're not trying to get praised. You're just trying to be a good family member. I had a great grandfather. His name was Theodore. And at age 60, he did an amazing thing with his faith. He went and got a medical degree at age 60 back in Germany where he was from. He went back there to get that medical degree. 
in dentistry so he could go to South America and be a missionary. In fact, he's kind of one of my heroes. And people always talked about my great-grandfather, Theodore, how cool it was, how amazing he was. He lived to age 90. He continued to evangelize. He used to, on his own, baptize people in the St. John's River. Well, that's great. But my great-grandmother, she stayed home. She stayed home. They had about five kids, including my grandmother. She did her daily life. She began taking care of grandkids as they came. She cooked. She went to family gatherings. She held down everything while he was gone back and forth for about five years. He wrote a journal how wonderful it was to sail away, to go to Panama or to go to um, Honduras and to meet the people and to spread the word. Friends, she did exactly what the Lord wanted her to do. And it was just as amazing, probably more, definitely more than what he did. That little seed of faith in you, uh, it's enough. When the disciple says, increase our faith, Jesus says, you've got enough. Look at your faith in a different way. Believe God Believe what God is saying God will do and do what you're asked. That's faith. To God be the glory. Amen.